Listeners, my name is Shannon Cooney from Merrick Property Group Real Estate Agency and a very proud sponsor of the Paracave podcast. If you own a property in the Penrith LGA or Lower Blue Mountains and would like to know what it's worth in today's market, give me a call on 0421 588 Broadcasting live from the Paracave, the world famous Paracave. Hello and welcome to another bumper episode of the Paracave podcast. My name is Troy Warner and I'll be your host this week and every week. And today it is episode number 116. Can you believe it? Getting right up there. And today, once again, I'm bringing you an interview celebrating the 75th year anniversary of the Parramatta Eels in the competition. And my guest today, well, he started his rugby league career off at the Parramatta Eels. However, he also played at three other clubs in the rugby league competition, the Gold Coast Chargers, the Auckland Warriors, and the North Queensland Cowboys. But he is best known for his time at the Eels, and that is Mr. Lee Odenryan. Now, during the chat with Lee, we chat about how he got into rugby league because he came from a soccer background as a kid. Uh, We also chat about his early rugby league memories, his debut game at the Eels, and in that debut game, playing alongside Parramatta Royalty, Brett Kenny, and being coached by the legend, the Crow, Mick Cronin. We also chat about that highlight run versus Martin of Fire. I could not have an interview with Lee Odin Ryan and not ask him about that. So yes, that run at Parramatta Stadium in 1992 uh, against Martin of Fire, it is world famous, so we'll get his side of the story. But he also played in the game as well, which Parramatta won 22 uh, 16. And he played in that game only after five first grade games, he was already playing an international team. We chat about the Super League wartime, uh, playing for those other three clubs that I mentioned at the top. retirement and life after footy along with some common league questions and the personality set of six questions as well and much much more so much to get through so much to listen to all brought to you by major sponsor jack's pale ale exclusively available at Parramatta leagues club in the club shop and also a shout out to co-sponsors Shannon Cooney from the Merrick Property Group, who you hear every week at the top of the show, uh, the Stubby Club, and listeners for the best present. You know, Christmas is only around the corner. It is coming up. Uh, For that best present for that sports fanatic in your life, the Stubby Club has a huge range of sports merch and gifts to choose from. All you need to do is just head to thestubbyclub.com.au and remember to use Paracave at the checkout for a 10% discount. And also Bo Cook from Loan Market, your local Penrith mortgage expert. Everything from first home loans, refinancing, and home loans, and more. Bo Cook and his team, he is the man with the help and the answers. How do I know? Well, Bo and his team helped me and my lovely wife Amanda with a home loan. So we have that personal experience with what Bo and his team can do for you uh, during these difficult financial times they will get you the best deal. So you can contact Bo today on 0401 213 236. Get in contact with him today for a free chat and see what Bo and his team can do for you and let him know that you heard it here on the Paracave podcast. Thank you to all the sponsors with your support. It helps the podcast grow and reach more people, which is much appreciated. But enough of me talking. You don't want to hear my voice all day long. So enough of me talking. Let's get into the chat with Leapin Lee Odenryan and have a listen to his rugby league and life story. So as Hindy says... Get a beer, coffee, whatever you want. Sit back. 
relax and enjoy and let's get straight into it. Hi, it's Lee Oden Ryan here. Um, I used to play for Parramatta, Gold Coast Chargers, New Zealand Warriors, and a brief stint at the North Queensland Cowboys. And I'm about to have a chat with Troy Warner on his Paracave podcast. And as you heard from his intro, my guest today on the Paracave podcast is a former professional rugby league player at the Gold Coast Chargers, Auckland Warriors, as they were known, now the New Zealand Warriors and the North Queensland Cowboys, but he's probably uh, best known for playing at the club that I love in the Parramatta Eels. Uh, He played 132 games, scoring 49 tries and also kicking 41 goals. Uh, A player I watched play his whole career, and with it being the 75th anniversary of the Eels in the competition, why not get another Eels player on and celebrate the Eels? So welcome to the Paracave podcast, Eels player number 504, Mr. Lee Odenrein. Hi, Troy. Thanks for having me. Not a problem. Thank you very much for joining me. Now, doing some research, it said that you were born in the same town as Jamie Lyon in Weewa. Is, is that correct? Yep, yeah, that's right. Still um, got some, some family up there. Yeah, what what um what was your early childhood like? What, what sort of activities in Wee War did you get up to? Um, well, I didn't really spend much time in Wee War. Um, my dad was in the Navy and Air Force, and um, so he moved out of Wee War to join the Navy, went to Vietnam, and, yeah, he had okay. a long career in the de- Defence Forces, and as such, I moved around a lot as a child. Okay, and then um, you were a pretty handy uh, soccer player early in those early days, uh, weren't you? Yeah, I played a, played a fair bit of soccer actually right up until I was 19 before, yeah, switching across. Okay. H- how did you f- um, find rugby league or did rugby league suddenly find you? Um, I think we found each other okay. at, a, at a small little drinking hole in Wallachia. Oh, Just yes. Outside of yeah. Yeah, I went down there and I caught up with, they used to have their Sunday night presentation with the group six. So they had under 19s reserve grade and their first grade. So I managed to bump into, I think, the captain of the under 19s. And I was complaining that the soccer was getting cancelled all the time because of rain. Okay. And he said, well, why don't you come up to, um, have a run with us and just even if it's just to keep fit because I said I'd never played rugby before and yeah one thing led to another and they were short on players and I filled in and yeah it went from there. Okay wow I I know the Wallachia Hotel pretty well I'm a a Penrith local and uh, have spent many a night in the Wallachia Hotel (laughs) in back in the back in the day. Um (laughs) So then, looking back now, what would be your earliest rugby league memory? Um, to be honest, like, I was such a, a jack of all sports and okay. probably really a master of none. But <laughs> I, I did, as a child, um, I did support the, the Dragons, okay. George. And, yeah, I remember my favourite player was Stevie Morris. Oh, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah the halfback and... Um, my brother, I had an older brother who was a mad Parramatta supporter. So he would be dressed in the full Parramatta attire whilst I was dressed in the St George um, clothes, yeah. Ah, nice. Some... That went on for a few years. Yeah, yeah, some nice friendly rivalry then, I guess. Now, yeah. uh, how then did you find your way uh, from the uh, Wallachia under-19s to the Eels? Well, um, so I played about half of the the year in the under-19s, finishing off there, and then the A-grade coach, who happened to be Bob O'Reilly's brother, okay. Mark O'Reilly, yeah. So he uh, he invited me, I think, at the presentation night to... Uh, he asked me how would I feel playing um, first grade in the Group 6 the following year. 
And I said, oh, yeah, that sounds sounds good. And he just told me, well, you need to get a haircut, and get rid of that earring. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. So it went from it went from there. I played in A grade, and um, I had a good, a really good, good year there. Um, still finding my feet um, in rugby league. Um, I actually got offered a contract with the Raiders um, okay. during that time, but I decided um, that I I went down there for a trial, and I just decided I decided it wasn't the right time for me yet. Um, so I ended up playing the next year. They had um, the Metropolitan Cup. Yep. I think it was just starting. I had signed a contract with the Steelers too. And remember they had the oh, draft? Yeah, yeah. But, yeah, that didn't work out on the draft. They, they said, yeah, I was. I must have been like sixth pick or because Graham Murray came around to my house and I signed a contract, but that fell through. And, okay. yeah, cut a long story short, um, I played in the Metropolitan Cup for 10 games, but then I broke my collarbone. Um, but the next year I managed to um, – I signed with Western Suburbs, trained all, all year with them, and just before – two weeks before the season kicked off, they had a bit of a clean-out and I was one of them. Okay. So I rang Mark O'Reilly, my my um, my former coach, and he said, well, just leave it with me. I'll give Bob a call. I know they've got a trial with the Roosters on the weekend, their last trial, before they do their grading. So they got in touch with me and they said, yep, you can go there to Parramatta Stadium and we can't guarantee that you'll get on, but, yeah, we'll see what see what happens. And lucky, luckily for me, after 20 minutes, both wingers got injured. Oh, wow, yeah. So I got on and, yeah, just did my best and um, they virtually, Ron Massey came down and um, I scored, like, a couple of tries and um, they signed me on the spot. Oh, perfect. Yeah, so that's how it all kick-started and, yeah, then, um, yeah, it just the went is, from there. The rest is history. <laughs> <laughs> Could you believe as a young 22-year-old that you're in the same team as Parramatta Royalty in, in Brett Kenny and being coached by the, uh, the Crow, Mick Cronin? Yeah, it was – everything went so fast and I was so immature. Like, I look back on, on my, my time in rugby league and uh, I was – I wasn't only really green and new to football, like which showed obviously a lot when I played, but um, I don't know, I was so naive and immature. And, yeah, it just it didn't really click until like now I look back and I've got a, a better perspective about about all that time that I, I played. Yeah. yeah. Um, what was Mick Cronin like as a coach? Because it was struggle times in those early 90s and uh, yeah. he was obviously a Parramatta legend and... Um, I'm assuming he'd be like a, a quiet, humble coach. Yeah, he was. A, he's a cha- champion guy, as everyone would probably say. Hey, I'm not the person that's that could probably rate coaches. Um, I would say, yeah, Mick and all the coaches that I had, yeah, they all did their best. Um, I, I didn't find any issues with Mick. The only issue in most of the times in the years that I played was with me and not the coaches. They're all they're all good in there. In their own way, I um, I know Mick. Um, Mick had that personality that everyone kind of warmed to, and um, that's probably how he got the best out of the players. And what are your memories of your debut game against the Roosters at the old Sydney Football Stadium? Yeah, I, I still that was probably one of the games you always remember you first, I guess. So, um, Peter Sterling actually came down. He got injured the game before I made my oh, debut. Okay, yeah. Against St George, I think it was against St George. I think he did his shoulder, um, but he went straight into the commentary and uh, he came into the change rooms. I know after the game and he congratulated me and he said that's one of the best debuts I've seen. Oh, so, how, it was, did, how did that make you feel, uh, Paramount yeah. Legend, saying that? Yeah, I was, I was pretty stoked. Yeah, because all I ever wanted to do, like when I decided that I wanted to try to make it into great football. I made a decision um, that I was going to chase it. My goal was only to play one one game. Okay. And yeah. then, then I managed to get a reserve grade game in and then a, then I set a new goal, I want to play a first grade game. So that's, yeah, it was, yeah, it was, it was, um, it was a, an achievement that I always look back on and 
something that I'm proud of. Like Jared Payne, obviously, in the NFL, like everyone could say, oh, he didn't, didn't yeah. make it. But he did. He did make it. He, he, he played NFL football, yeah, something that he definitely. can always treasure. Yeah, no, nah, for sure. Um, massive achievement. I mean, I haven't played first grade. You have. So, um, yeah, yeah. Nah, any any first grader who plays even one game, um, it's a massive achievement. So, um, no, nah, that, that's great. We, we, we've just seen the new Sydney Football Stadium open up, which is now Allianz Stadium, um, I think three weeks ago. What are your favourite memories of playing at the old, um, old Sydney Football Stadium? Um. I always liked playing there. It was a really good ground. It was always a fast track. It drained well. Um, yeah, so probably not a, a great deal of strong victories or anything. There was some lean years there in Parramatta when I was around. And uh, But, yeah, I guess any of these these games that you play, that you got to look back and just be glad that you experienced that. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, in those early days, who were the... Um, older players that took you under their wings? Um, well, I know you like you mentioned previously, we had Brett Kenny and, and we had Mark Laurie when I played. Um, and while at Parramatta there, we had some other players, experienced players come along as well in the likes of Paul Dunn and uh, and a few other players. Mark Horro, yep. like players like that that were, that were experienced. So, yeah, right. um, Scotty Mann and oh, yeah. a few of them players, um, Shane Flanagan. Yeah. Yep. Um, so there was a number of players that had Michael Speechley was another one that oh, comes oh, to yeah. mind. Uh, they were all good blokes, good players, and were doing their best, yeah. Yeah, no, definitely some great names there. there. Uh, as we just said, that 1992 season was a, a little bit of a lean season, but there was um, – if, but when you talk to older Eels fans like myself, there's two highlights that stand out um, definitely to us um, and probably to yourself as well. Um, uh, the first one was it was a victory against the Great Britain side, Turing side, um, that was pretty well stacked uh, with names such as Gary Connolly, Gary Schofield, uh, Sean Edwards, Dennis Betts, Phil Clark, just to name a few. And the other one was Martin Afire. Now... Before we get to the sprint race, um, after only playing five games of first grade, what was it like playing against an international team? It was all like mind blowing, blowing stuff for me. Then I had so much going on. Everything seemed to. I look back now, and everything seemed to happen so quickly. You made it into. I made it into grade football. Made it into reserve grade. Three games later, they said, "Listen, we've got another couple of wingers injured as well, and Ericsson and Scott Ma, Michael Ericsson. Yep. We're going to thrust you in first grade." And I was thinking, "Geez, am I ready for this?" You know. So uh, it was. Yeah, it was just. I, I don't know. I, I guess I just took it in my stride. And then when they said, "You know, we're playing Great Britain," it was. Yeah, it was going to be playing against some of these guys best in, in the UK or in England, it was, uh, yeah, it was pretty exciting stuff. Yeah, and no, speaking to uh, Shane Flanagan and uh, Stu Galbraith for the podcast, um, they they were heaps excited to play in that game and, and to get the victory as well against, uh, as I said, a stacked team. It was an amazing night. And um, now to the much publicised and talked about uh, sprint race versus Martin. Um, yeah. I know probably everyone talked to you about it um, and and why uh, you, or how and why you beat Rugby League's fastest man at the time. Um, what is your take on that run and is that the fastest that you've ever ran? Well, a lot of people ask me about that race and in particular... I don't know if you know, but my background was athletics. Like I said, I, I had a, I was like a jack of all sports, but not very good at schooling, but knew when all the sports carnivals were on and yep. mainly the athletics stuff. Like every year I would make it to the state final in athletics right through the high, end of high school. So I remember when I broke into rugby league, Scotty Mann came up to me and, and remembered me from Little Athletics. Oh, okay. He said... I didn't know him because he goes, you used to win all, always the sprints and I'd always be, his aspirations were to beat me. Okay, yeah. 
Um, so, yeah, so in the athletics side of things, um, and then you've got a lot of people saying um, that it was rigged or this, something something went on there, Martin the Fire through the race and there was bets, and I think that's all a load of BS, to be honest. Um, I was... Um, I was always pretty slow out of the box. So our condition, head condition or head trainer was Rob Roland Smith back oh, then. Oh, yes, the great man, yeah. And I told him because when they asked me, they said, how do you feel about we're going to put this race on um, in the curtain raiser at half time? We want you to race smart and fire. And I read up about him and, <laughs> you know, and knew what a tri-scoring machine he was and how fast he was and there was talk that he was just outside Olympic qualifying times and all this stuff. And all I wanted to do was not embarrass the club and fans. And yep. So my goal was just to do as best I could. So I had a chat with Rob Roland Smith and I said, hey, mate, very slow out of the blocks. And I think it was his idea. He said, well, we'll do some training on the starts. That's pretty simple. So we did some training on the starts and um, that's why when I shot out, of the blocks, people said I jumped the start, but I knew because I was training with him being the starter, so I knew uh, when the gun was going to go. Yeah. So I got that start, and I just held on to that, um, held on to it, and um, two meters past the 25, and still in front of me at the halfway. O'Fire struggling to get to him. Open Ryan, he's going to create a ball over. Open Ryan by a meter. A tremendous run. The young 22-year-old. Five games in the top grade of Winfield Cup and he's blowing out Martin O'Fire. A little thing to for you is um, about 12 months ago, I think it was 12 months ago, so Martin O'Fire had a podcast and he, they were asking similar sorts of questions and yeah. it brought up that he had this race and he said, listen, you know, let's face it, um, and no disrespect to Martin O'Fire, he's fantastic, better than me, like played so many games, scored so many tries, but... I think he still had that bad taste in his mouth because he said, let's face it, if I had, if Lee Odenright had beat me in that race, no one would know who Lee Odenright was. And I agree with him, probably <laughs> correct. Um, and he said, if you watch the game at Parramatta 1, I scored a couple of tries against him as well. Um, and if you watch the game too, just because he scored the tries, he, it was cut back in by the centre turn mark the fire back inside. Yeah. So he went back infield, infield and yeah. I had to turn and chase, but he wasn't actually straight on marking me when he scored those tries. So after he said that podcast, one of my mates went onto his Instagram and said, hey, you seemed uh, still pretty irked about that race back in mine and two with one of my good friends, Leap and Lee Odenright. And he goes, I, I, and in the message he goes, I actually spoke to Leo, Ryan, and he told me that he beat you fair and square that night and he would do it right now as, as well. Put your money where your mouth is. Next minute a promoter got online and contacted Martin Fire and he put them onto his managers and it was all ready to kick, kick off for another reunion last okay. year. Yeah. And Martin Fire apparently said he wanted £10,000. Um, <laughs> he wanted flights and they were going to set up a a luncheon and do all that stuff. And then a couple of weeks after that, he got in touch with that promoter and he said, oh, I need some more time to think about it. Um, and I can understand that because I started training. I've been trying to keep fit and all yeah. that. And do you think I could not get an injury? <laughs> yeah. so I was the first one to put my hand up. Thank God that didn't happen. He probably would have beat <laughs> me anyway because he looks super fit for his age. Yeah. Um, oh. I tell you what, I think all the fans would love to see that. I mean, we could get you to Combank Stadium and uh, half time during a main game. We could uh, get it all happening. It'd be a, a, certainly a great thing uh, for the fans, I reckon. And, oh, and I, I would disagree on that. <laughs> mate. I think they, they'd rather see, you know, like these two old guys. I think I would even rather see people like Ado Carr and Saab and all that race off here. Um, have you ever spoken to Martin about it at all? Him himself? Uh, no, I just know after the game he was running. When he finished, he was swearing a bit, you know. Yeah, but, okay. um, yeah. I know a mate did. Yeah. One, of, um, one of the guys I played with, I think it was Josh White. Okay, yeah. Yeah, Josh White yeah, spoke to him overseas about it. Yeah, okay. Uh, nah, fair enough. Um, and as I said in the intro, um, you kicked 41 goals during your career, mostly at the Eels. Was that coming from a soccer background? Um, 
that you had that kicking abil- ability? Yeah, that's like something I always look back at. And see, I just would put the ball there. I played soccer year right through till I was 19 and I'd kick a football. The issue that, that I had was that I didn't have any specific training and technique or anything like they've got now and, and even like years and years um, probably after me when Daryl Halley had started training people. Yeah. Um, maybe if I had a bit more coaching on the techniques, possibly could have been a, a permanent goal kicker. But yeah, I was just relying on natural ability, put the ball however and just kick it. Hence the reason I didn't go on with goal kicking. Was it the fact that we had the, or oh, you had the great man Michael Butner in the team as well? He was a bit of a goal kicker at the Eels there for a while. He was probably a little bit in front of you. But um, is there a goal? Is there a goal that you kick that stands out in the memory? I know I had a, a good kicking when we played Western Suburbs. I know I kicked a few there. I think I kicked one, one from the sideline there because remember I said earlier how I was with Western Suburbs and yeah. they got rid of me two weeks before and we played Western Suburbs and we gave them a bit of a flogging and oh, I kicked, nice. I think, six from, eight, six from eight. So, yeah, I was, I was pretty happy about that. <laughs> ah, nice. Now, 1995 will be your last year at, at Parramatta. Um, yeah. What are your favourite memories of, of playing at Parramatta? Who, who were the people that you like used to hang out with and um, any favourite memories that stand out? Um, I know the fans were great, always the best fans. Um, in all the, t- the four teams that I played for, the Parramatta fans were uh, the most avid and, you know, friendly because uh, I used to do a bit of work in the club as well. Okay. So there's so many people there, some good people at Parramatta. Uh, players and that I used to hang around with, Mickey Butner, like you said, and Scotty Mann. And, uh, yeah, other memories that I had. Yeah, like that Great Britain match that you, you mentioned, that was one of the, the highlights. Um, in 92, we also beat the 1991 Premiers. We had a good win there, I think 20 nil against the uh, against the Panthers. Um, what else was there in 92? Yeah, the race, that's probably, yeah, that's probably yeah. it. Yeah. Beaten, yeah, beaten them and beaten Panthers. We didn't do too much more that year. Yeah, no, nah, it, it was lean times, but uh, nah, there's yeah. some great memories there. Um, do you get to many uh, para reunions, either in New South Wales or, or Queensland at all? I went to the, a first reunion last year and they had a, must have been for the Queensland contingent, and they had it at the Titans ground, and okay. I went and caught up with a few players there. Ah, nice. Mark Tukey was there. Yeah, Tukes. Big yeah, players. there was, yeah, was a few yeah. players there. Yeah, no, nah, Troy Campbell, he's doing some great stuff up there in Queensland, uh, trying yeah. to get all the boys together again. And, uh, nah, it's good that you guys can get together every now and again and share old wool stories. And um, in that 1995 season, the uh, Super League was in and around bearing its ugly head around. Um, what was that time for you like, the Super League time? Because 1995 was the last year at Parramatta. Uh, yeah. Did you want to stay at Parramatta in 96? Well, I just bought a house there in Castle Hill. But me looking back at um, at my career and my time at Parramatta, um, it was a roller coaster. Like, I'm not kidding you. Um, yeah. It had its ebbs and flows, its ups and downs and all the rest of it. um, I guess I was trying to, all I was trying to do was cement some sort of future that I could help help me with this house that I bought. So when Super League came along, um, my negotiations with Super League weren't that great because I wasn't playing good and I was back in reserve grade and stuff, but I managed to get a contract uh, with them and, um, yeah, I guess Parramatta being a staunch ARL club uh, moved me on, which I think was the right decision for both of us because I needed to kick up the backside and move into the Gold Coast was probably the best thing that could have happened to me. And I've got a question from a a massive fan of yours, uh, Matty Tate from Tate Sports Cards. Um, And he asks, was there ever, ever an offer or a thought of coming back to the Eels at some point in your career after leaving them? No, there was no, no, no truth in that at all, yeah. No, no. Um, 
I know after the Gold Coast, I um, I had a really good year the following year. Um, I guess I knew that I started to grow up a bit, realised that I had debts to pay and um, I needed to do something if I was going to try to prolong my career. But uh, I, I started to get interest, but it was more aligned with the Super League okay. um, because we'd signed everyone was – up in the air about what's going to happen in 1997 yeah. with this this split between Super League and the ARL. So I was obviously feeling around what I was going to do. Was I going to get a contract? Who knows? Okay. And yeah. Then it just happened. Well, you mentioned there the Gold Coast. You you were the top try scorer that year for the Gold Coast. Uh, what are your favourite memories of playing at the Gold Coast? I got a lot of fond memories <laughs> of the Gold Coast. Yeah. yeah. I always say it was probably my best year um, okay. in the, the, the seasons that I played um, under Phil Economides. Um, yeah, I, I guess I took a more professional approach there too. I know I didn't really go out at all. Um, at the Parramatta, um, while I was at Parramatta, I had a lot of, like I said, I was very immature and I was probably worried more about what was going on off the field than rather than on okay. the field. Yeah. But, um, yeah, played with some fantastic players um, at the Chargers. Um, Marty Bella, Jamie Goddard, Brendan Hurst, Jeremy Schloss. Um, Dave Watson had come over the Kiwi okay, from, yeah. from the UK, yeah. And the conditions and training, everything was just perfect. Yeah, we didn't probably make it to the semifinals or we didn't win as many games as we could, but I think Phil brought the best out of me as well. He was a, he was a good guy. I used to play a lot of golf with him and, yeah, we used to talk. Yeah, some of yeah. the guys that I've spoken to uh, on the podcast, I think like Scotty Sattler and um, especially him and a few other guys, Jamie Goddard, they've said that Phil Economides was a, a great coach up there at the Gold Coast. Yeah. Uh, now, and then you moved to the Auckland Warriors, as they were known uh, back then. Was that a tough move to move to another country and keep your rugby league career going? Um, the move was never – moving has never been an issue for me. I've done it since, like I said, yeah. I was a kid. Um, every couple of years um, we would pick up and move with my dad in the Air Force and, and Navy for 26 years. Um, so when I got approached by the, the Warriors, um, I think John Money and uh, – Ian Robson, who was the CEO, they came to watch me play at – we played the Crushers where we gave them a pretty a pretty hard time that day. I think it was yeah, one of their worst worst games that they played. But um, So the Warriors would play whoever the Chargers played the following week. So oh, okay. yep. the, every week they were watching these videos. They weren't actually looking for a winger. They had Sean Hoppy and – not sure who who had they had on the other way, um, but then my name get kept getting called up. I was scoring some good tries and having yeah. some solid games, and my work ethic was really good. I was, you know, my goal was to try to get the the ball in my hand as many times as I could because I knew I was fighting for a contract. I only had a, you know, I had a really small contract with the the charges, so I knew that I had to pull something out of the bag. And, yeah, they approached me and they flew me over there. Okay. Um, we had a buy, I think, and so I flew over unbeknown to Phil Economides and the other guys. And uh, when I arrived in Auckland, I oh, was freezing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what I was worried about because that's why I didn't get the camera. It was too cold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so that's how that came apart. Obviously, I had a Super League contract, so it was just a matter of trying to pick a, a club to go to and they showed the most interest, so. I was happy to move over there. It was, yeah. Yeah, no, fair enough. Well, um, you played most of your career at the Warriors alongside someone that we mentioned just before, um, former guest, and someone I've grown to call a mate as well, Big Tooks, Mark Tukey. Um, yeah. What was it like playing footy with Mark Tukey? Um, yeah, it was. I was probably, I think when, um, when did Mark Tukey, do you know what year he, he started there? I Mark think Tukey. it was 99, I think, 2000. I think, Tukey. I think it might have been... 2000. Yeah. I've got him down as 2000. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So um, 
2000 was was another year, like I said, of the roller coaster for me. Not a great year, so I didn't get to play. I only played, I played 18 games. So, but Mark Tukey was also like, as you're aware, a crowd favourite yeah. at Parramatta and and the, the Warriors champion guy. Um, very easy to get on with, and having another Australian there in the team was someone that I could relate to. And yeah, yeah, no, it's good. Yeah, no, with him. yeah, no, he's a champion fella. Champion bloke doing great things as well. Uh, what are your favourite memories of playing at the Warriors? What what really stands out for yourself? Um, that World Club Challenge was, yeah, I still look back at that and the, the teams that we played against um, from England yep. and the good victories that we had. Um, playing with some of them great players, that was one of the reasons that I was quick to say, yeah, let's get on board, let's go over to the Warriors with all them players that they had, the Steve Kearney's, the Matthew Ridge, the Sean Hoppe. Yep. We had such a strong side on paper that just didn't put it together on the field, unfortunately. Um, so, yeah, but some of the highlights over there, we had some, some really good games, um, some good victories, but it was very hot and cold. Um, yeah, it was unfortunate. Um, things didn't work out there. But um, my time in, in New Zealand was really good, and that's one of the reasons after I finished football, I decided to go back there. Okay. Yeah. Um, do you keep in touch at all with many of the New Zealand players that you played with over there? Um, I kind of lost touch with when I came back to us, when I finished my football and I joined the police. Um, I'd matured more as an adult and I was really uh, highly driven and like football, I put my heart and soul into the policing, trying to be a detective as quick as I could. And then next minute, yeah, I'm I'm doing all this serious stuff with the police. So the football side of the the people at the football and all that culture, I I really wanted to move away from that type of stuff and, and try to, to, to start a new life because I wasn't a real great person when I was when I was at football, like I said. Uh, yep. Yeah. No, nah, that's fair enough. And then uh, after the Warriors, it was a, a move up to the North Queensland Cowboys. How and why did that move come about? Um, Mark Graham, who coached the Warriors for a couple of years, um, he obviously was from there. He was Tim Sheens' his offsider. Tim Sheens tried to sign me right at the start of my contract. So okay, yeah. unfortunately for Tim, he got me right at the end and probably, yeah, my body by then was packing it in. Um, my brain was for football. I wanted to really give my best, but I think um, my days were numbered. And after just, I think I played three first grade games, got dropped back to reserve grade, played three reserve grade games. And I looked in the mirror and said, mate, you got to give it away. Um, there's new guys coming through, and yeah, that's how it ended. Was that a disappointing way for yourself to end your rugby league career? It was disappointing because me as a player was probably was probably one of the most disappointing um, stints that I had. Like I had some really pretty shocking games there throughout all their, their years. I had some really great games as well. Yeah. I was very inconsistent, the first to put my hand up, but... Um, yeah, it was it wasn't a great way to go out, especially if people had, were knockers. Like I've had the knockers right through my career, coming from like soccer and all yeah. that stuff. And yeah, it's a bit disappointing. But what do you do? You got to move on. Well, just think, Sterlo retired the same way, mate. Injury, so um, <laughs> he was forced to retire. Play than me. Oh, he was forced to retire through through injury. So. Um, yeah. Before you did retire, did you have some sort of idea as to what you were going to do um, after retirement? I was always interested in getting into the commentating okay. side of things. Yeah. And I, when I was in New Zealand, I, I, I had my own newspaper column there at one stage. All right. I also... I was living with a, a woman that was the PA of the head of Sky TV. So Sky TV were running like the Foxtels, the, the, the cable TV over there. And I was communicating with her and they were interested in me possibly doing some sideline stuff. Yep. So hence I flew back over there 
and set up a meeting to meet with with Sky TV, um, and that didn't that didn't work out. And I think that's when Daryl Halligan, Tia Rapati, and someone else got okay. a, the job in front of me. But um, I just started working there, and yeah, did a couple of jobs, and then joined the police. Yeah. How did you handle that transition from uh, playing week in, week out football to uh, a normal everyday uh, job life? Very, very difficult. Took me years. And I've been reading a few articles about former footballers uh, dealing with the struggles of, uh, of transitioning from professional football to obviously new vocations that they've got. And, um, yeah, for me it took years and years because um, I was used to training a couple of hours a day and then going back to these, like, I think one of my first jobs was, like, I was working for Coca-Cola, so I was doing these these um, these runs um, from supermarkets and, and obviously dairies, they call them over there, 7-Elevens, and it yep. was full on, sometimes finishing as late as 9.30 at night. Starting at seven in the morning. Yeah, wow. And then I then I became the, a sales manager for a timber company, and that was fifty to sixty hours a week. So it was a big shock to the system. Yeah, definitely. You don't realise, like I said, when you're young, you don't realise how good you got it. And I didn't. I just took it for granted. I wanted to play one game, and it just yep. just kept going. What would be your advice to uh, current day young players in the game? Um, about what would happen uh, after football? Yeah, I think I'm, I'm, I'm sure that they've probably got people in those positions that go around to club and, and give good advice. But, yeah, it would probably be somewhere along the lines of make the most of what you've got, the time, because obviously the lifespan of, uh, of professional rugby league players aren't that long. I was reading an article yesterday that they were saying about um, four years is the average at the moment and decreasing um and yeah just be the best person you can you know someone that can get up in the, in the morning and look in the mirror and know that they've not only done their best for the club and their fans but off the field as well because that's where rugby league has that stigma unlike in new zealand like everyone wants to play rugby union and yeah, be an all black yeah but um rugby league's a fantastic game um, and, yeah, there's a lot of young guys that come from low socioeconomic backgrounds, especially in New Zealand, and uh, that's how I launched my career at the police. Most of the, the lower socioeconomic over there play league and the more affluent children play want to be the All Blacks, so they've got to play union, yeah. No, definitely. Well, you mentioned that's wise advice there uh, for any young players listening. Um, you mentioned before Jason Saab and... Josh Addo Carr, um, do you watch much rugby league these days and are they the sort of players that you like to watch play, the the fast wingers? Yeah, definitely. Um, great players. Um, yeah, Jason Saab and Josh Addo Carr, great for the game, all these speedsters. And like you said, the fans, I think that's why some of them warmed to me. I wasn't the best player, but I had the ability to score a try when the opportunity arose. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, there's so many uh, good wingers out there today, big, strong, um, good jumpers. Um, yeah, the, the cross-kick bombs are, are, are prevalent now. and Yeah, I, I love watching them. That would be a, a good match race to see, wouldn't it? Josh Adokar versus Jason Saab. Yeah, I, I, I don't think anyone's got an idea or no one could be definite to, to say who would win. It would be pretty close, I would say. Yeah, Definitely. Unfortunately, Jason's gone down with a, a ACL, I think. So won't be this year, but hopefully we see it uh, in the future. Now, um, you played for four clubs. Do you yep. support the game or do you support a team that you used to play for? Um, I know Parramatta have always been good to me. I grew up around that area. I went to North Rocks Public School before I... Uh, I did a couple of stints there. We went back backwards and forwards from yeah. state. And, um, yeah, Parramatta were really good to me. They gave me the kickstart that I um, um, that I needed in, in allowing me to play first grade. I had a great time in New Zealand as well. They really looked after me. And, um, 
and I also had a, a great time in uh, the Gold Coast. So when these teams, everyone's ringing me, who are you going for and all the rest of it, I just can't pick one team. Yeah. Now that Parramatta there, I'm going for Parramatta, of course. Okay. I hope they hope they go all the way. Yeah. Nah, and I, um, I they've got so. the ability to. Yeah, no, nah, definitely. I, I hope they do too and, and yeah. that premiership drought for sure. Um, got some common league questions brought to you by one of our sponsors, the Stubby Club. Uh, and you can use the Paracave 10% discount code uh, by heading to the stubbyclub.com.au. Um, we spoke about the Great Britain game and the West game that you played in. Is there, is there another game that you played in that you thought, oh, geez, I really love that game for whatever reason? Or do those two just really stand out? Uh, for, for Parramatta, that's the game that stands out. Um, I guess for the Warriors, the game that would stand out in, I know I scored a hat-trick against the Cowboys in 1999, but I'm still filthy I didn't score four tries. Okay, what happened? They, <laughs> they put a kick through and I beat everyone to the ball and it was like five metres to – it pulled up like five or ten metres short of the line. But there was someone obviously chasing, so the only option I had to was to try to tow the ball forward. Uh, so I kicked the ball forward, and these cowboy players are ready to jump on it. And I said, I've got to jump now, and hopefully it'll just be on the line or just over the line. So when I grounded it, apparently they went back on the video, and it was like a couple of centimetres from the line. Uh, and then I then I went on to score a hat trick after that. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. So it could have been. It could have been. Um, Four tries, but nevertheless, that was one game, and yeah, I had a I had a couple of good games in that challenge, the World Club challenge, and yep. I think the semi-finals against the Broncos, I I scored a couple, but I bombed a third try too, and they were strong back then, you know, like with some of the players they had, with the the Renoffs and the Car Tony Carroll, the Wendell Sailors, the Langers, the Walters, they had everyone. Yeah, no. Just, Definitely, definitely uh, some great memories there. You mentioned a few names there. Who would have been the um, hardest to tackle then oh. on your opposition? I'll tell you my first experience, I think it was in 1992, when I had no I had no idea how to tackle my smoking yeah. radio, let's face it. <laughs> um, but I remember playing against Jason Croker and the Green Machine down at the Raiders and Michael Butner was helping me out all day as Jason Croker was palming me into the stand, <laughs> left, right, centre. He would be one of the hardest that I had to tackle, along with Wendell Saylor and John Hopewadi. I don't know. Oh. I can't even tell you, honestly, if I actually tackled <laughs> them. <laughs> I probably had five pistols for five attempts. <laughs> oh, mate, I, I, don't, I wouldn't have any chance. Don't worry about that. Um what about uh, on the flip side? Who would have been the hardest that tackled you? Oh, what was the biggest hit that you copped? I remember watching on the Wide World Sports, I think, one year. Um, that had the hits of the year. And it was that um, the big prop from Manly, Solomona. Oh, yeah. Yes. The boxer. Solomon, Solomon, Solomon Homono. Oh, sorry. Yep. Solomon Homono. Yep. Yeah, I think he hit me like on one line and virtually I ended up like 10 metres back on another line. It was like in the yeah, hits wow. of the year and I, I got a bit of um, bit of crap put on me after that <laughs> too. So. Oh, mate, you shouldn't have got crap put on you for that. I mean, that's a, <laughs> yeah, he's a massive hitter for sure. Now, other than your home grounds that you played at, did you have a favourite ground that you played at? Uh, yeah, obviously, oh, yeah, besides Parramatta, um, what was another fast track? Up at the Cowboys suited me because it was such a fast track. Yep. I remember Manly was being more like a goat track. It was real heavy with that Kai Q. I hated going there Yeah. because yep. after about 10 minutes, your legs felt like cement. Um, a lot of the grounds were good. The Sydney Football Stadium was always spot on as well. Yeah. Oh, and New Zealand, that Mount Smart, yeah. Okay. The amount of rain that they have there and the drainage and all the rest of it was always in perfect Perfect, Nick. Well, you sort of answered the the next question, the least favourite ground with Brookvale, and uh, probably you probably hated going down to Canberra as well. So, oh, uh, definitely Canberra, yeah. 
Yeah, no, nah, that, that gets a mention a lot of times. Yeah. A lot of times by a lot of guests. Who was it that you were glad that you had in, had in your team, uh, in the teams that you played in? Um, when they played, you were confident that you were going to win the game? Um, well, in the, the early years, you had these guys like Brett Kinney. You know, Brett Kinney was there and um, Michael Butner was always there, obviously, trying to help me out with yep. uh, obviously some of the defence. So in the Parramatta years that I was there, while we played with Brett Kenny um, and Michael Butner, they were always a, a, an asset for the side. Then um, a, a couple of players in uh, in the Warriors that stand out would be players like Ali Lawatiti. Oh yeah, great player. If he if he was on, he would he could just destroy teams. Um, other players that were there, like. I said there were so many great players that, that I managed to play with at the Warriors uh, that actually went on to do a lot of good things. One of the hardest players I remember at Parramatta, I remember Shane Flanagan was 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 tough as nails. I remember him getting stitched up, stitched up on the sideline and abusing the train or the doctor for taking too long to staple him up. Oh, wow. Um, but in New Zealand, um, Quentin Pongia, was probably one of the toughest guys I knew of and obviously sad circumstances surrounding him. But um, he was one of the toughest players around that forward pack that I had the privilege to, to play with. And you had obviously players like Joe Vanganar and Steve Kearney were all fantastic as well. But when you talk about cement and players like that, he, he comes to mind for me. Yeah, and uh, champion players there and, and, yeah. and rest in peace, Quentin. Um, yep. you've mentioned some great names there. Is there someone that you would have loved to have played with or even played against during your career? Uh, I, I wouldn't say play against because it was always so good knowing these guys and, and, and playing alongside them. Um, it's just unfortunate I look back at some of the, the teams at the Warriors and they still manage to do it now. It's just... Like Parramatta when we beat uh, beat Great Britain, just you know, just everything comes together. Yep. Um, but yeah, there's so many players like uh, Matthew Ridge and all these players, Stacey Jones. They were just fantastic players to play against. Um, what about a player in today's game? Would you love to play against or with? It would be a great experience to play against any of those wingers, like um, the likes of Josh Adokar and, and Jamie Saab and, and these types of players. Yeah. Um, there was another one. Not, another great wing was is the Roosters winger, that Tupac. Oh, I'm very, yeah. very impressed with him. He's got everything. He's got such a great work ethic um, and his ability to jump above the, the defence and score tries. There's just so, too many to mention, Troy, that, yeah, um, yeah that, is yeah, it there? That, the oh. games, the games changed and evolved so much. It's it's great. Yeah. What are your thoughts on uh, today's game to to when you played? Do you like the way it's going at the moment, or could there be yeah, a change or two? Yeah, hundred percent. Like you look at some games and you go, "Yep, yeah, that probably would have suited me." There's high scoring games. It's you know who scores the most tries. Um, the defence is probably still great, probably better than what it was when I played, and it's more structured. But, uh, yeah, um, I just love the way the game's evolving. And yeah, the, one of the only things that I guess that they keep bringing all these changes in to, to help with the game and move it forward. So I guess there's things that you've got to just probably get your head around and, and just move forward with. And no doubt you would have loved to have played in the uh corner post era where you could touch the corner post and still be deemed to score a try? I often think about that, eh, like <laughs> these big diving wingers and, you know, the thing that I always lacked and I, I was I was susceptible to dropping a, a ball here and there quite regularly, you know what I mean? I haven't got real big hands. Like you look at some of these guys' hands, even look at Sonny Bill Williams when he's commentated the size <laughs> of his hands. Yeah, they're, they're massive, huge. yeah. Like holding the ball, you know, being able to hold it with that one hand and dive out, yeah. Yeah, no, they're amazing. Amazing. No, I, I'm not quite sure how good I would have been at that <laughs> diving. 
But you might have scored yeah. more tries uh, had the corner post rule been in, that's for sure. Um, who did you find in your teams or the opposition was the biggest pest or, or sledger on the field? Uh, I know Matthew Ridge from the Warriors was always the best and it would be just on the games. It would be even with his own players on okay. and off the field. And it would start the minute you walked in to the building for training. And it wouldn't stop until you've gone, got in your car to go with him. Um, so there was always a lot of sledging. He was the main sledger that I, if in New Zealand, I guess the manly guys that played alongside him would probably say he was good too. Was I that, remember Ricky St- Sorry, was that just to um, get the best out of you guys at, at, at your own club or um, if, just the type of person he was? I think it's rugby league. You probably talk to a lot of players. There's always banter. Everyone's yeah. trying to get one over the other person. Yeah. Uh, but on the field, like, he wasn't frightened of ripping you a new one. Okay. Um, Ricky, yeah. Unfortunately, when he got injured and he retired, we didn't really have anyone over there that could step up because although Stacey was a fantastic player, um, he was a little bit quiet. That was – if there's any de- – um, if there was one thing about Stacey that I could probably pick out, the only thing I could pick out would be possibly his – yeah – his talking on the field could have been better. And you were going to mention Ricky Stewart there, I think, before? Yeah, I remember Ricky Stewart. Like, not only did we cop some good hidings down there, but I remember him sledging some of the Parramatta boys and that, you know, and um, I still remember I remember him sledging Cameron Blair once and asking Cameron Blair as they packed the scrum why he wasn't playing reserve grade. <laughs> and, um, but, yeah. Um, yeah, he was always one of those players, and uh, Gary Freeman was another one. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there was there's a fair few of them. Yeah, those names get mentioned quite a lot, uh, indeed. Um, did you play in that game in '93? I think it was where Ricky broke his ankle. No, I only played a, I only played about three games. I think for a handful of games in '93 because I had two operations on my groin. Oh, okay. Yeah, it might have been a little bit of karma then from all Ricky's uh, sledges <laughs> or something. Who who knows? But um, your nickname, Leap and Leroy, where, who gave it to you and, and why is that? How did that come about? Um, I think it was either, I think it was Ray Warren, maybe. Okay. It was Ray Warren or Mark Warren, one of them too. Yeah. And I, I'm not quite sure where it came came from, really. I used to like to jump up, obviously going for the, for the football, but... Yeah, Leap and Leroy, they used to call me, yeah. You didn't like so, it? <laughs> oh, I just took it in my stride. No, it's stuck, yeah. stuck yeah. yeah. Nah, fair enough. Well, we'll wrap things up with the personality questions, the segment I call yep. the Set of Six, brought to you by Jack's Pale Ale, exclusively available at Paramount Leagues Club. Um, you said at the very start that you were a jack of all trades, master of none. Um so what would be your favourite sport outside of rugby league? Um, it'd have to be soccer. Yeah. yeah. But fo- things just didn't work out with soccer. Um, yeah, I had a big break with my dad moving around um, in the really important ages between, say, 13 and, say, 13 to 16 or so at like that, then three years yep. where I stopped playing soccer. Yeah, they kind of yeah, they impacted on me a, a fair bit. Do you watch much of the EPL? None of it. No? Okay. No. I don't follow soccer or anything now. It's okay. just like me. Yep. Yeah, I, can watch the, I can watch the union as well because okay. I lived in New Zealand for so long. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I'm right into the union as well. Yep, nah, cool. Uh, what's your specialty dish in the kitchen or on the barbecue? <laughs> um, I, I cook a fair bit of uh, Thai food. I used to work at a, a Thai restaurant when I was in New Zealand. And oh, nice. I was actually sponsored by a Thai restaurant. Oh, nice. nice. And yeah. um, the guy's still there. He's still there in Auckland. I spoke to him about a week ago. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah so... Um, I hadn't spoken to him for ages, and I used to take some of the warriors down there at lunchtime and they would have a feed of Thai, yeah. 
Yeah, nice. But I, yeah, so I, I cook a lot of Thai food. Yeah, I, I don't mind a bit of chicken pad Thai myself. It's <laughs> not too bad. Um, who was the most famous person you'd love to meet and have a chat with? Who would it be? It's a difficult question. It is. There's probably so many out there, but... Um... Yeah, is there, is there one that stands out that you, you've you seen and you thought, oh, I'd really love to sit down and talk to him about his career or, or whatever? If we're talking about actors or someone, it probably someone yeah. like Leonardo DiCaprio, okay. you know what I mean? Yeah. And I'd, I'd tell him that I've probably got, you know, I, that's what I keep telling my wife. She's getting a bit old in the tooth now. He, once they reach 25, that's it. <laughs> so I'd say we've got, you know, we've got a lot in common. So. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fair enough. Um, if you were stuck on a deserted island, which former, uh, which three former teammates wouldn't you want to be stuck with and why? <laughs> Matthew Ridge is one of them. <laughs> yeah, don't blame her. Yeah, okay. Um who else would it be that I didn't want to didn't want on the island that I played with? Uh yeah. Yeah. Very, very difficult, uh, mate. Because too that, many? That's not a good question. I don't want to be on a podcast that's saying to, <laughs> you know. Ah, oh, no, that's okay. That's all right. You said no. the opposite, yeah, I probably could rattle a couple off. But like like I said, I, I have I've lost touch with a lot of those those guys, unfortunately. Well, if they listen today, hopefully we can all get you back together again and uh, in, in communication. Um, if you weren't, uh, uh, you started rugby league pretty late, but uh, you took that on as, as most of your career. If you didn't do that, what profession do you think you would have done or maybe wanted to do growing up? Yeah, well, I always wanted to be a police officer, hence the reason when I uh, retired, um, I wasn't quite sure if I could get in. That was okay. my uh, issue because I did just prior to uh, to playing with Parramatta, I went and tried to enlist in the New South Wales Police Force and I was knocked back. I failed the uh, the aptitude test, but like me, I was so immature, I just rolled up. No preparation, no okay. nothing. Didn't yeah. have any idea of what the exams were and when I retired, I did all the right stuff, went and found out what you got to study, what questions they're going to ask, and I breezed it in. So policing was always something that I wanted to do. And I, and I managed to, yeah, obviously achieve that. Is that what you're doing today, in these days? No, I, I just finished. I, okay. I, I retired um, I retired two years ago from after doing 16 years in the police. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Uh, who is your favourite band or solo artist to listen to? Um, my last stint at work, I I, I just um, finished working four years out at Broken Hill and got right into my country music. So okay. um, never was into country my whole life and now that's the only thing I really listen to. Like I love Luke Combs and, you know, Chris Stapleton and all these different, you know, um, country and western singers, um, Midland, yeah. So, yeah, got dreams one day of going over to Nashville. And oh, yeah. Listen to some good music, yeah. Ah, nice. Did you manage to jump on last week and get Luke Coombs tickets? So, uh, go I on. was going to. I was that close. The wife said we've got to go and buy the tickets now, and I said I just don't know if I can plan that far ahead. <laughs> My mate was even texting me. He got tickets. I said, "How about we? Because we always want to go to America." I said, "We'll go over to America. And we'll we'll." We'll see him there. Yeah, I know. Hopefully. There's a lot of frustration from a lot of fans last week on, on Ticketek uh, trying to get tickets to his uh, concert. What's your favourite Luke Coombs song? Uh, there's a number of them, eh? I was just, yeah, When It Rains It Pours, um, Better Together, um, Beautiful Crazy. Yeah, there's so many of his songs. I love just love his voice. I might have to... Yeah. Uh, get on that uh, bandwagon, I think. I've got a few <laughs> friends who are massive fans of Luke Coombs, so yeah. must be the new country sensation, so I might have to get on that uh, bandwagon. Well, Lee Aden Ryan, thank you very much for your time and your chat today here on the Paracave Podcast. I really enjoyed it. Uh, I appreciate your time. I'm sure the fans will love it too, and uh, 
you were a player that was one of my favourites players to watch, um, and probably those para fans of my age as well. Um, and a player I watched play his whole career, and I hope to one day catch up and say good day and uh, listen to more of your rugby league stories. Um, so, Lee Aden Ryan, thank you very much for coming on the Para Cave podcast today. Thanks, Troy, for having me. And, yeah, thanks for all the fans that obviously keep this great game going and those people that supported me. Thank you very much and yeah, all the best. Well, welcome back and thanks for listening to Lee Oden Ryan and his rugby league and life story. I really enjoyed it and I hope you did too. It was great to chat again to a player who played at the club that I love in the Parramatta Eels and celebrating the Parramatta Eels 75th anniversary. Uh, I thank Lee for his time and his chat. One of my favourite players from back in the early days watching Rugby League and the Parramatta Eels. I hope to maybe catch up next year They're up there in Queensland when Parra plays up there and say good day, Lee. So hopefully we can do that. Once again, a quick shout-out and thanks to Jack's Pale Ale, the fantastic major sponsor of the podcast, for supporting the podcast. Don't forget, Jack's Pale Ale is back and available to purchase in the club shop. It is perfect for that Eels fan or beer lover. Drop into the club shop and get some today. And also keep an eye out on the Parramatta Leafs Club socials for the Monday to Thursday specials in the Bistro as well. Some great deals there. Thanks also to co-sponsor Shannon Cooney from the Merrick Property Group. Contact Shannon for all your lower Blue Mountains and Penrith real estate needs, either buying or selling. And also the Stubby Club, thank you. And don't forget to head to www.thestubbyclub.com.au and order your NRL or EPL or AFL or um, what's the one in America? The NFL, there we go. Merchandise today using the Paracave discount code and you will get 10% off. And also... Bo Cook from Loan Market. Once again, his contact number is 0401 213 236. Get in contact with him for a free chat and see how he and his team can help you get on top of your home loan and find you that best, the best deal. Please support these businesses that support the podcast each week that help bring you quality entertainment. Share the love on socials as well. Thank you once again to you, the listeners, for listening to David Penner and his rugby league and life story. Wasn't it interesting? There were some laughs thrown in and some really interesting stories. What was your favourite story of the podcast? Let me know on the socials or leave a review and comment on the Apple Podcast site. Thank you for sharing and that podcast with your family and friends. And don't forget... If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to the podcast so as soon as it drops, you will be able to listen to it. And finally, or also, not finally, also, you'll be able to catch me, yours truly, on the Pulse FM 89.9 radio station each week on a Friday and a Sunday Uh, These days, we're going to be talking about the Rugby League World Cup, now that the NRL season has finished, uh, and that will be with the Duckman himself on Duckman's Weekend Sports Wrap Show. So it's usually about 6.20pm each of those nights, and it's on 89.9 FM radio. Thanks again also to the official media partner of the podcast, the Parramatta Times. For all your local Parramatta news, simply head to www.parramattatimes.com.au. Thank you to all those associated with the podcast. It's most appreciated. In the meantime, though, uh, until next week, stay safe wherever you are listening from in this world of ours. Uh, 
to the podcast and enjoy the Rugby League World Cup that is currently on. And speaking of the Rugby League World Cup, a shout out and thank you to all the listeners from the USA, UK, New Zealand, Ireland, France, and of course, the Aussie listeners. Thank you for listening to the podcast each week and the support. I really hope you enjoy it. Uh, And please, if you do, like it, leave a comment where you're listening from and what you would in or what you enjoy about the podcast as well. It'd be really interesting to see and 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 read where you're listening from. Have a great week as best you can and I'll catch you next week for episode 117 but for to know who's coming on episode 117, please stay tuned to the socials to see who is coming up next. And once again, if you want to send me a DM on socials, by all means, go ahead. Always up for a chat about the greatest game of all and the Parramatta Eels or who you would like to see come on the show. I'm on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. Just search The Paracave Podcast. But to sign off the show, and as I always say, The Paracave Podcast, by the fan, for the fans. Go para! Or, should I say, at the meantime, go Australia!